going back into the archives and pulling out a Pastor Chris classic. Jesus. So if you're visiting with us for the very first time, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is not your mama's church. Preaching! Isaiah 46, 9 through 10, and I have a word from the Lord this morning. In the King James Version, it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning. Let me just say that again. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, say, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Holy Spirit, I pray for an impartation of your word this morning, Lord. I pray, Holy Spirit, for transformational power that comes over your word, through your word, in every believer, Lord. Touch their hearts, touch their minds, Lord. Stir up their spirits, Lord. Shake them loose, Lord, from the place that they're standing, Lord. I pray, Lord, that as your name is lifted up on the south shore of Staten Island, you'll draw every man unto himself. Now, Lord, I pray that you crucify my flesh, that I not contaminate your message. And I pray, Lord, that you build up the body of Christ this morning and give them hope. Let them know, Lord, that you have mantled them for greater things. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to teach you a little bit of Hebrew and Greek this morning. If you turn over your bulletin, there are no fill-ins. This is an old-fashioned preaching message. It has no teaching involved. God said in Isaiah 46, 10, He declared, watch me now, He declared the end from the beginning. And He says, I know the plans that I have for you. He declares the end from the beginning. That word end in Hebrew is akarif. It means future. So let's reframe it quickly. God says, I declare your future from the beginning. And I'll watch over it to see that it comes to pass. And I will do as I decide according to my good will and my good nature. God has, once you were birthed into the body of Christ, God has a plan. The Bible says that all should be saved. But you have a decision to make. And once you make that decision and come into the family of God and come into covenant with God by accepting His Lord and His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I become adopted, the Bible says, into the family of God. And it is at that moment that the plans that He has for you begin to accelerate. And God says, you know what, Chris, I've had some plans for your life. Now that you're part of the body of Christ and you're in covenant with me, I have went ahead of you and declared some things. I chose your school. I chose your college. I chose your wife. I chose your job. I named and numbered your kids. I even know the number of hairs on your head. I went ahead of you. And now, Chris, I'm going to come back and get you and walk you into your destiny. That's what God is saying. How do we know that? The confirmation is in Psalm 139. King David wrote this in Psalm 139, 13. For you created me in my innermost beings. You knit me together in my mother's womb. God goes before you and he created you and fashioned you with gifts, talents, and treasures to do what? To do the things that he called you to do. And he's fashioned you specifically to do the things that he's declared to do over your life. You just got to come into alignment with his will for your life. Remember last week I showed you the picture of the parade. The Macy's Day Parade. God says he knows the end from the beginning. If I'm sitting at the Macy's Day Parade with my daughter and I see the floats go by, as I mentioned last week. Uh, is that the Lord? Is that the Lord? If it's not, put it on vibrate. Thank you. We 
we see the floats going by. Kermit the Frog, Spider-Man, and we only see each one as it passes through our frame of vision. But as I said last week, God's perspective is that he's sitting up in eternity and he sees the entire parade from the end to the beginning. Just like he does your life because God's perspective is a heavenly perspective. I can't really explain it to you. It's one of the mysteries. But God has went ahead and declared some things into your life. And now he comes and gets you and brings you into your destiny. You know, we had a rowboat back in New Dorp High School when I last preached this. But <laughs> this is what it means. And this is why I titled the message, Rowing Into Your Destiny. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this. I know, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for wholeness and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. That word future is the same word as end, akarif. God says, I know your end from the beginning. And the word akarif, it means this in Hebrew. That which is behind you is in front of you. That's deep, not Billy. How, how does that make sense, Pastor? That which is behind you is really in front of you. Let me show you. Here's what it means. It means as you get into the boat and start to row into your destiny, that which is behind you is that which is in front of you. Are you getting this? You ever see the guys that are rowing? You gotta be in sync. Because if you get one oar in the gown, the other one out, like I don't know how to row a kayak. And I got one time, I was all over the place, and I had to stop and reset the oars in the water and develop a lot, the cadence. So, 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 and if you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, what happens? Is that we get off course because we turn around, and I got the Lord, oh no, 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 and, and then we get all off course. The main purpose is to keep our eyes on Jesus. That's why they say you walk by faith and row by sight. Yeah, walk by faith, not by sight. I say you row by faith and not by sight. We row into our destiny. We fix the course to a destination where we feel God is calling us to go. And what happens sometimes? We're in the boat rowing, and we're in the boat rowing. And we say, oh, Lord, here comes a storm. Here comes a storm, Lord. Lord, I, I, I think I'm going to have to row around the storm. And we start to get off course. Because Jesus says, I have made you not to go around the storms of life. I've made you to go through the storms of life. And every time you choose to go around the storm, you're not developing the character necessary that he wants to perform in you by going around and not through. Well, I'm preaching to somebody. Well, today. Well, See, you got to get one of those GPSs. God positioning system. And you got to set it to the frequency of the Holy Spirit. And you can't become fixed on storms and obstacles and detours. you got to stay focused on Jesus as he stands in the boat with you and gives direction. Stroke, stroke. He's the master, the author and the finisher of our faith. We have to keep our eyes on him. And what happens too many times is we're in the boat. Great job, Tanya. We're in the boat. And we tell Jesus, I'm going to go around this storm. And he says, no. And we take what I call the anchor of regret. And we drop it off the side. And the progressive work of God in our lives gets stalled. And we're stuck. No, oh, come on, help me, Holy Spirit. Yes. We get stuck in our walk with the Lord because we drop the anchor of regret. Mm. We look at situations and circumstances mm. ahead of us and we allow that to determine the truth. The devil is a liar and Jesus is Messiah. Yeah. This is the truth. This is God's word. It's been true for thousands of years and it'll be, come, it'll be in heaven waiting for us when we get there. Get to know the word. Get to know the truth. We get set up for regret, despair, and discouragement. What we have to do this morning, brothers and sisters, is cut the rope that links us to the anchor of regret. 
Some of us are stuck in our spiritual walk because we have regrets and we're looking to the past. And yesterday, yesterday is behind you. Your future is so bright, you have to wear shades. Hope is in the future. Regret is in the past. Here's Webster's Dictionary. Definition of frustration. Look familiar? <laughs> a deep and chronic sense of insecurity and dissatisfaction arising from unresolved problems. Oh, well, they just mount up when, when you don't. I'm just going to put the blind up. I didn't see that. Word. Unresolved problems begin to mount up in your life. And unmet needs. Husbands, guys, we have a wonderful men's study on Wednesday night. Brother, Alfredo, is that off the charts on Wednesday night? Unbelievable. We're starting to look at us and who we are and how we relate to our wives and our children and our families and our bosses. So we get our needs met in Christ Jesus. If he meets my needs, I, you, can't, you can't let me down and you can't let me down and you can't let me down. No offense. Why? Because I dance to an audience of one. I dance to Jesus. And if I know all is well with my soul, with the Lord, I guess your opinion is your opinion. I'm going to keep growing into my destiny. Hallelujah. People will let you down. God will never let you down. We get stalled or delayed on the journey because we're frustrated. We fix our eyes on the things of the world. Brothers and sisters, we have to fix our eyes back on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Activate your faith. Be around fellow believers. The women's group meets on Wednesday night. we got two, two weeks left of the women's group. Uh, the, 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 the courts is hearing the voice of God about the Holy Spirit and how you can fine tune your spirit to hear the Holy Spirit. Come on, ladies. Get out of the boat. Activate your faith around fellow believers. And if you're tired, just set the sail to the wind of the Holy Spirit. Set your sail to the wind of the Holy Spirit, and then you will gain enough momentum. Is that when you run into the devil, you'll say, Devil, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go around you, I'll go under you, but if I have to, I'm going to go through you. But, Devil, I'm going through to my next season. There's nothing going to stop me in the Lord. That's how you can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's how it's done. Not on my strength, right? not on your strength, but on Him working through me. Oh, hallelujah. Either way, you have to get into your destiny. Just like this church. We went down there with 30 people. 30 people! New York State Assemblies of God is calling me up and saddle up saying, how did this happen? Can we use this as a model? It's like, how did you guys, we didn't do it first of all. It was the Lord and it was you and you and you and you and you and you. Because of your faithfulness. Too much who is given, much is expected. Wake up. You sleep and my sermons. <laughs> Either way, this church is headed into its destiny. And the devil can't stop us. We got to leave the past at the cross of Jesus Christ. And look <laughs> to the future. Let me bring this into New Testament context. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, 3 through 5, we went over the scripture last week to a smaller degree. Ephesians 1, 3 through 5 said, Blessed be the God of our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. He has given us spiritual blessings. That's easy to understand. Ephesians 1, 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. Verse 1 and 1 and 5 says, Having predestined us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. God says, I've been waiting for you, and I have a plan for you. But in order to get into the plan, you have to first get into covenant. And once you get into covenant, see the Bible says, he wants all people to be saved. But you have a choice to make. Man has a free will. And you can't get into God's perfect will or even into, into God's family without having Christ in your life. Once you have Christ in your life, then God sets in motion the plan. He has a predestined, and I'll get into the meaning of that, God has charted the course for you. 
He has set your assignment. This is where, when you hit that sweet spot in the gift he has given you, you experience significance. We accept the fact that God has given us gifts to use in the body of Christ, no matter how big or small the task. We take on the assignments, and then joy and satisfaction flow out of that. And you start accomplishing that which God set forth for you to do. If you're an usher, a worship leader, a greeter, kids church worker, an intercessor, whatever it is, God has given you gifts. And when you move into your future and start using those gifts, you receive fulfillment. Satisfaction and joy that only comes from the Lord. Not the satisfaction and joy that man can give you. Because that's fleeting. But the joy that the Lord gives you is deep down in your spirit. That's where God imparts true significance to a person's life. When you become in alignment with his will for your life. It's not hard to find. It's not that hard to find. Ephesians 1 and 5 says he predestined you. Now people get that confused with a whole bunch of different theological meanings. I'm just going to break it down in the Greek for you. The Greek word is pro oritia. Pro oritia. It means pro moving towards oritia is your horizon. You ever sit at South Beach or at the shore and you see the sun go down and you look and, and it's where, where, where the, the, the water meets the, the horizon? God is saying, I pro horizon you. I've already set your destination once you're in the body of Christ and you're saved because you can't get to your destination outside of being saved. But once I'm saved, God says, I know the plans I have for you. And now it's our job to come into alignment with him because his word says he pro you. He pro he moved you towards your horizon. Each step you take everywhere you go, you're moving into perfect alignment with the will of God. You're moving into your destiny. God said, I walked it out ahead of time and now I'm coming back to get you. Let me prove it to you. I was a freshman in high school, 1980. Me and my mom lived in Jersey City. We had a 78 Chevy Nova. And on every Friday, we used to go over to Sears at the Staten Island Mall and go to Farrell's Ice Cream Parlor. Anybody remember Farrell's? Amen, the guy with the whistles and the bells and all of that. You know, we didn't have a lot, but what we had was from the Lord, and we enjoyed it. The only place that would give my mother a credit card was Sears. So guess what, we were going to get a new pair of sneakers. We were going to Sears. Every Friday or every other Friday, we'd go out there and have a little ice cream and get something uh, uh, at Sears. And I remember one night they had just built ICC Central, the church with the big white steeple. And a 12-year-old little boy who was already saved and baptized, speaking in tongues in the Holy Spirit when I was 10 years old. We drove by ICC on a cold October evening. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I pressed my nose up against the back window of that white Chevy Nova. And I said, Mom, why do I feel like God is calling me to that church? And we went on a merry way. But the Lord never let me forget that moment. And then back in 2003, I had my own church in Bayonne. I was... Christmas shopping with a buddy of mine at the Staten Island Mall. I was coming back this way. And I was in my Acura. And we slowed down by that church. And I told my buddy, I said, why do I feel like I'm going to get married in that church? Lo and behold, it was two years later that Denise and I would get married at ICC Central in 2005. How does God do that? Because he says, I know the plans that I have for you. And way back in 1978, 33, 30 some odd years before that, he was giving me some winks and some signs. He said, that's part of your future. And as if I didn't miss it in 1980, in 19, 2003, as I'm driving by, he did it again. He said, you're going to get married. 
married in that church. I said, what did you say, Lord? And I felt them drop it in my spirit. And if you listen, and if you have a relationship with Christ, God will speak to you and drop those little nuggets in your spirit on where you're supposed to be going to church and what ministry you should be involved in and what's going on in your life. I can't explain the Bible no clearer than that. Bringing that into your life and understanding how God had already pro horizon my life. He was just waiting for me to get back in alignment with him. And I'll get more on that later. So God was saying, Chris, I already marked some things out for you back in 1980. He knows the end from the beginning. Why? Because his perspective is a heavenly perspective. Ephesians 2 and 10 says, You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works for that which he had ordained, that you should walk in them. He already knew the gifts he needed to give me. My Uncle Phil and my, my Uncle Phil was a preacher in Jersey City. My grandmother birthed a church in Jersey City in 1942, the Christian Apostolic Church. It's in my DNA. My great-grandmother birthed a church in Naples, Italy, as a direct result of the Azusa Street's outpouring in 19, 1907 in Azusa Street, Los Angeles, California. The Holy Spirit went right into Italy, touched my grandmother, and they started an apostolic church in Naples, Italy in 1910. I know the plans I have for you. I know the plans. God said... You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That word workmanship is poema. It means he knit you together. He fashioned you. He fabriced you like a yarn and tapestry. He gave you, Kenny, the gift that you need to play. He gave you the voice, Kim, that you would need to sing. He gave you the mind, Eric, to read sheet music because he knew the plans that he has for each and every one of us. You just got to Get into alignment with what he has for your life. I used to watch my grandma, my grandma down in crochet. We used to watch the Met game back in the 70s. Remember that team? And we were good. In 72, we went to the World Series. We lost to the Oakland A's. We had uh, Buddy Harrison, right? Felix Mion, Ed Cranepool, Cleon Jones. Willie Mays was on that team. Jerry Grody, Tom Seaver. Jerry Kuzman. God gifted me with a good memory, too. <laughs> I used to watch my grandmother knit, crochet. You hear me, Carol? Boy, Sal's mom. I used to watch her. And I could never tell what it was going to be until she got a little bit further down. And then I knew it was a blanket or a hat. And God says, he crocheted you when you were in your mother's womb. He knew exactly the plans that he was having for you. And he fashioned you, crocheted you, and knit you in your mama's womb to do what? To do what he's called you to do. Thank you, Lord. Ephesians 1 and 11 says, In whom we have already obtained an inheritance. What's an inheritance? Your mom and dad, heaven forbid, pass away. They leave you the house, the car, the, 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 the whole farm, right? God said, I adopted you into my family through the blood of my son, Jesus Christ. You're adopted into my family. Now you have an inheritance, which is a heavenly kingdom. Everything is yes and amen when you're here waiting to be transported to where we're all going if you're saved. And he says, you have an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who worked out all things after the counsel of his own good will. That word purpose is prothesis. Anybody ever go to college? Mr. Belosis? You have to write a thesis, right? A thesis is what? Why something does what it does. You got to write an 11-page thesis on the theory of relativity or whatever it might be. And God says... I already prothesis you. He went ahead and wrote the script. Now all you got to do is come into alignment. Watch this. I'm 15 years old. I turn away from the Lord. I go out into the world. I start drinking and drugging and I get lost for 17 years. For 17 years, when I'm 33 years old, I have an encounter with 
Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit and God writes me right back into the script where I should have been. Come on. It don't matter how long you're out there, Ken. It matters if you get back into the wineskin because all that time that we missed doesn't matter. He knows the end from the beginning. He can reinsert you in the script. Why? Because he's the author and the finisher of the faith. So I was backslidden, Ray, for 17 years. Thought it was all over. I can never reclaim that inheritance. And God said, I wrote the script. And when you're 33 years old, Chris, the same age my son was crucified, back here, I'm going to write you right back in like nothing ever happened. And I'm going to use all your mistakes in those 17 years <laughs> to glorify my son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He can write me back in the script anytime. Brothers and sisters, let's come into agreement today that God set us on a course to become who we are in Christ. Take your eyes off the world. Take your eyes off the television. And focus them on Jesus Christ. Let's not try to superimpose our plans on the plans of God. Be careful. Because you can miss it. You have to be careful. You get caught up in the world. Sidetracked, even being saved. Ecclesiastes 6, is, 6 and 9 says, Better is the wandering. Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of desire. This is also vanity and vexation. What does that mean? I can be in his will, growing into destiny. Wow, that's a nice Mercedes Benz. Wow, that's a beautiful house. Wow, that's a beautiful this. And what happens is that as we're growing into our destiny, we use the scripture. God, you said you grant me the desires of my heart. That's what the scripture says. You want to listen to the name and the claim it preachers on TV. And we need to step out of the boat and asphyxiate our eyes on our desires. And we don't even know it. It takes us slightly off course out of God's perfect will and into his permissive will. And we start not feeling the joy and satisfaction that we need to be in direct alignment with the Lord. We start to get involved in vanity and how things look, how I need, who's got the iPhone and this, and the upgrade, and the next newest car, and all of these other things. Sometimes the desires of our heart can lead us astray. And we say, God, grant us the desires of our heart. But we have to be careful about getting off course. Let me begin to wrap it up with a story of my friend Jacob. In Genesis chapter 29, you see this guy Jacob. In Hebrew, Jacob is Yaakov. It really means hand on heel. Because when he was birthed, his brother Esau and him came out of the womb as twins. And his brother Esau was trying to kick him in the head. And he had his hand on Esau's heel. But Jacob also in Hebrew means supplanter or deceiver. Now, Jacob was a swindler. He was a shady character. I don't know if he grew up in Jersey City, Brooklyn, the Bronx. But he could take the milk out of your coffee. And you wouldn't know it. He was slick. He robbed his brother of the birthright blessing. What is that? That was the inheritance, okay? Mom and dad were going to pass away. Uh, 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 Isaac had a big farm, 2,000 cattle, sheep, all of this thing, the whole farm. So he goes to his brother Esau, and they're both starving. They need food. And he says, Esau, if you sign over the inheritance to me, I'll give you a bowl of porridge. And Esau's so hungry, he signs over the birthright blessing. And he steals his brother's inheritance. Now his brother's irate, and he's chasing him to kill him. And here we go. Jacob is rolling into his destiny real fast. And he's going and he's, he's looking for the plans that God has for him. And he rolls up on his Uncle Laban's house down the road of peace. And he rolls up on Uncle Laban's house and he says, wow, this is a nice place. Look at this. Cattle, farms, tents, women. I ate chihuahua. <laughs> and he fixes his eyes. Ecclesiastes 6 and 9. He fixes his eyes on a little cutie named Rachel. And he says, hey, how you doing? Is that your camel? Uh, 
have Verizon Fios in them tents? <laughs> and he says, hey, Uncle Laban. Rachel, and she, she's fine. You think I can get with her? And he says, you want to marry Rachel? He says, yeah. He goes, all right. I'll tell you what. You work seven years on my farm, tilling the fields, feeding the cattle, the sheep, the oxen, and after seven years, I'll give you Rachel. Seven years? Seven years. Okay, I'll do it. Seven years of desire <laughs> to get what he wants. Now, Rachel had a sister named Leah, the older one. Now, it was the custom among those tribes to marry the older one off first. Now, I don't know what's up with the Bible, but it says that Leah was not attractive <laughs> as Rachel. Now, listen, it's not all on the outside, brothers. If you're attracted to her flesh, you're already set up. The devil's already got the hook in your nose. The first thing, listen to me, whoever's not married in here, the first thing you're going to... Oh, there. Wow, there you go. The first thing that you're going to be attracted to is the person's spirit, not the flesh. The flesh will deceive you. If you're chasing the flesh, you're going to get the flesh. But the first thing that will align you and your future husband and wife is your spirits. They will be connected. Anyway, so he sees Rachel, he makes the deal for seven years. Seven years go by and he's ready, boys. Ooh, ooh, is he ready? He's ready. They have the wedding going. The wedding's going on. Da -da. Preach on, Pastor Chris. 
think I will. Leah was God's choice. Rachel was Jacob's desire. But God calls Jacob to embrace something that is not very attractive. What is God calling you to embrace in your life that's painful? What's God calling you to embrace? Now here we go. The Bible says that Leah had four sons. Everybody say four sons. As Rachel's waiting, he's doing his manly duty, having children with Leah. And the Bible says the first son that he had, he named him Reuben. In Hebrew you say Ruhabim. And that means to see. And he realizes that although he's not so much attracted physically to Leah, that by the birthing of this son, Reuben, he begins to see things from God's perspective. And he moves a little closer to Leah. And he has another son. Somebody say another son. And he names him Simeon. In Hebrew you say Shimon. It means to hear from God. Oh, so now he not only is seeing things from a different perspective, but now he's hearing from God with more clarity. Why? Because he's embracing Leah, the difficult thing in his life. Oh, I'm preaching to somebody. I just don't know who it is. <laughs> then he has a third son. Everybody say a third son. And he names him, say it, Mrs. Kessler. Levi. Levi. He names him Levi. He you say Levi. That's where the Levitical priesthood came from. Moses and Aaron. Mm -hmm. Levi means to become one with your God. Mm -hmm. So now as he embraces Leah, he begins to see things with more clarity. He begins to hear from God. And he begins to become closer with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Each child has a purpose. And put it all together... Leah has a purpose in your life. I don't know what who your Leah is, but God's going to call you to embrace it before he releases your Rachel. Mm. Mm. <laughs> then the fourth son shows up. Mm -hmm. Judah. In Hebrew you say Yehuda. It means to praise your God. And it is that moment that he has Judah that he begins to get his praise on. I will bring Praise, I will bring praise. No Leah formed against me shall remain. And the minute he begins to fall in love with Leah, God releases Rachel into his life. It's called obedience. I want to take it a little bit deeper. This pattern goes back to Exodus chapter 3. The Bible says that Moses see a burning bush. Reuben. The Bible says that Moses heard a voice coming from the bush. Simeon. The Bible says that Moses got closer to what he heard and saw living to become one with your God. And as he approached the burning bush, what he saw and what he heard, God said to him, take off your shoes. The ground you're standing on is holy ground. Worship Judah. Ooh, come on. Ooh, preach on, Pastor Chris. Amen. So what is God calling you to embrace? The difficult situation in your life. The moment you, like Jacob, start to embrace the difficult situations in your life. God starts moving you closer and closer and closer to your Rachel, to the desire of your heart. But it's not until you embrace the difficult things of life. And I got a word for somebody in here. You've been running. You've been running from church to church, from place to place. And God has called you to embrace Leah. And until you embrace her, the desires of your heart will never be released by the Lord. I got a prophetic word. In 2008, before we birthed the church, a new dog 
It said deliberately let go of everything that hinders your, your forward spiritual and physical momentum. Don't let up, stop, give up, or go back. If you persist in moving through the difficulties that have materialized at this point in your life, breakthrough lies just ahead. Refuse to allow disappointment or discouragement to devastate or to debilitate your faith. Be strong. Be strong. The enemy will lie to you and try and make you believe that you're not smart enough nor strong enough to do this. But I tell you that in your own strength, you may not be. But I am with you, says the Lord, and I am in you, says the Lord, and I will give you strength, and I will give you wisdom to overcome. Let's stand to Where are you growing to this morning? God has a plan for you. The Bible says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. It doesn't say that a weapon won't form. It just says it won't prosper. If you've been rowing into your destiny, you say, Pastor, oh boy, the Lord spoke to me today. Made it clear to me that I know what he wants me to do. There's a difficult husband. There's a difficult wife. There's a difficult boss. There's a difficult former pastor. There's a difficult stepson. There's a difficult stepdaughter. All sorts of difficulties. God is calling you to embrace your Leah. Oftentimes, He calls you to show that person the love of Christ in you. And when you do that, He grants you the desires of your heart. As Kim sings, and our altar team is here, if you feel like this message spoke to you,